Okay, well, hello there. Uh, my name is Eric Simmons. I am the digital editor at Bay Nature Magazine. Uh, welcome to Bay Nature Talks. Uh, I am really excited to be joined tonight by Bill Keener, the Cetacean Field Research Associate at the Marine Mammal Center. Uh, Bill has some absolutely incredible stories and photos, uh, even a few videos to share with us tonight um, about a subject that really needs no buildup. Uh, we are going to talk about whales, dolphins, and porpoises around the Bay Area. Um, so I wanna go over a couple of logistics first. Um, this will be about a 45 minute talk. Um, afterwards, we should have maybe 10 minutes or so to answer some questions. Um, if you do have a question anytime during the talk, um, please use the Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type it in. Uh, we'll collect them as we go. Um, we do have a lot of people here, so we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can, um, but we might not get to all of them. Uh, I wanna thank the David Brower Center for hosting this Zoom talk, providing our technical support for the evening. Um, we are gonna record this webinar uh, and we will email everyone a link afterward. So if you are having technical issues, uh, it will be viewable later. Um, finally, for those who haven't seen it, Bay Nature Magazine is a nonprofit magazine and website. Um, you can help us keep writing and reporting on the natural world uh, by subscribing or donating at baynature.org. Um, we thank especially those who made the suggested donation for this event tonight. Uh, your support lets us bring you this kind of event. Okay, so uh, let's get ready to talk about whales and I will hand it over to Bill. Great, thanks a lot, Eric. I, I really appreciate it. I, I'm really glad to be here. I actually have been a longtime fan of Bay Nature, uh, knowing David Loeb, the, the founder yeah, from years ago. And I think the Bay Area is really lucky to have you guys. And, and thanks also to the Brower Center for uh, hosting us uh, this afternoon. So let me share my screen so we can get my uh, talk rolling here. And there we go. And so um, I'm gonna be talking about cetaceans, which is the, the group, their family word for whales, dolphins, and porpoises, in particular, the ones in San Francisco Bay, because there's been a huge change. And it's really a, a story of environmental success in the Bay, as well as this tale of urban whales, these whales in an urban waterway. So there are four species of cetaceans that use San Francisco Bay now. There's the little harbor porpoise, the little big, bigger bottlenose dolphin, and we've got gray whales, and finally, last but not least, humpback whales. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about all four of these species um, this afternoon and talk a little bit about their uh, occurrence in, in the Bay, in San Francisco Bay, because the real story is that uh, I've been looking at the Bay for many, many years, since the 70s, and there were zero cetacean species in San Francisco Bay for decades and decades. And so now we've got four that we can see and I hope you get out and see them too. And I'll tell you how to do that too. So let's uh, get started. We'll, we'll go from smallest to largest. So this is the Harbor Porpoise. I hope you guys have had a chance to see these guys um, moving around San Francisco Bay um, because they're here 365 days a year now. And so what I want you to notice is the, the shape of this uh, dorsal fin here, which is just small and triangular, because that's what you got to look for when you're out uh, on the water. Um, the other interesting thing about them is that they're really short lived. They're on, they only live about an average of 10 or 11 years, which is the one uh, end of the spectrum of cetaceans where you've got some of the great whales living 100 years or more. Um, so these guys are really sort of life in the fast lane. And people often ask, well, what's the difference between a porpoise and a dolphin? Um, and that can be confusing because when I started studying them in the 70s, um, the names were used interchangeably. But now uh, scientists tend to talk about the small, cool water porpoises, half a dozen species around the world, and they're near shore, and the uh, bigger oceanic going um, dolphins, uh, like the bottlenose dolphin, uh, which is along our coast. And so the really the root of the words just came from the Latin porcus piscus, pigfish uh, for, from Latin for the porpoise and delphin or dolphin um, from the Greek. So that's how it sort of got started with these two different kinds of cetaceans getting uh, two different names, porpoise and dolphin. So the, the story uh, that really got us going into looking at cetaceans in the Bay is the harbor porpoise, because uh, we were out looking for them actually, and never saw them in San Francisco Bay, because in the 1980s, when uh, the uh, Farallon National Marine Sanctuary was being set up, we were going out in boats from San Francisco 
and trying to count harbor porpoises along the coast. And we'd find them outside in the Gulf of the Pharaohs, but never in San Francisco Bay. That all changed in 2008. And after probably a 60 year absence, they came back. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is the bay is definitely a cleaner environment because it's all about food. If there's no food, the animals won't be there. And they're attracted by small schooling fish, which is the prey of the harbor porpoise, like herring or anchovy or uh, jack smelt. Uh, and then there's some other things that were happening out in the ocean too that help this along. Um, and cooler water actually helps these porpoises. They like cool water, not warm water. And it's richer in oxygen and it's a better environment for them and, and the fish in the bay often too. So these things were happening in the 2008 time, time frame. That's when we first saw them. But, um, and this is what you'd see nowadays if you go out on a boat. And typically, of course, the people are always looking the wrong way when the porpoise comes up for one split second. But uh, this is the kind of thing you can see from shore. So sort of look at this shape because we're gonna compare that to bottlenose dolphins a little bit later. So I said, these guys have returned. How do I know that they returned? I didn't see them disappear. So wh what ha happened? What's their early history? And so you really have to go all the way back to the indigenous peoples living in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm talking about a couple of thousand years. So if you're ever on the you know, uh, freeway on 80 near Berkeley, you see uh, Ashby Avenue exit, but there's also Shell Mound Street. And that shell mound was a massive indigenous shell mound from the Coast Miwok. And they were, they had built that over 2000 years, probably around 2700 BC to around um, something like 1300 AD, this 50 foot tall a mound of shells and other detritus um, from sort of their, their midden, their, their kitchen works. Um, and uh, UC Berkeley uh, biologists went through that when it was being destroyed uh, starting in the, around the 20s. And now it's like underneath Ikea and some of that, that other area. But this was a huge thing that um, has harbor porpoise bones in it. So we know that they were somehow scavenging or collecting or hunting harbor porpoises for thousands of years in San Francisco Bay. Of course, things changed with settlement, the Bay Bridge and Treasure Island. Just imagine Treasure Island as an artificial island interrupting the currents in the bay. Um, it's very noisy. This is exactly the kind of thing that harbor porpoises and other cetaceans really don't like because they're creatures that live by their acoustic sense, their hearing, and very noisy operations drive them away. And even the Golden Gate Bridge, where we know there's porpoises today, when that was being built, they were blasting with black powder, you know, at depth, hundreds, hundred feet down. So that probably had some effect on them. And yet we know that um, from the uh, field notes of a UC Berkeley professor, that harbor porpoises were still in the bay until around 1939. And because he was seeing them when he'd go fishing and he even caught one and uh, penned it, it, illustrated it in his field notes. Um, but then World War II hit, and we think that's really the end of the era of harbor porpoises in the bay until recently. And it wasn't just the mines that they put outside the bay, it's really this submarine net that went all the way across from Sausalito to San Francisco. And I'll show you a picture of what this looks like. So here's an aerial view of this massive net that was miles long put in the bay and it kept every boat out. And it was constructed in Tiburon at a net depot, which is now the, uh, was the Romberg Tiburon Center and now is the Estuary and Ocean Science Center for the uh, San Francisco State University, the, the only marine lab for San Francisco Bay. And uh, when the, uh, during World War II, when this net was built, it was a four by four uh, net to keep submarines out. But on top of it, they laid these interlocking rings um, to keep torpedoes out. So it was a double net and that absolutely would have prevented porpoises from moving in and out from the ocean to the bay. So we think that was kind of the, the end of their, their time in the bay. They're back now. And one of the things we do is we got on the Golden Gate Bridge to look for them. And uh, off Cavallo Point in Marin County, 
is a really good spot to see them because offshore is a hidden underwater little mount uh, called the Cavallo Spire. And when water rushes in um, from, the, from the ocean, it hits this little uh, spire and goes straight up and it brings fish with it. And that's where the porpoises um, fish in these little eddies and whirls, uh, whirlpools there. Um, so that's kind of a, a nice uh, place to be able to go to see them. I, like I said, I've spent a lot of time on the Golden Gate Bridge in all kinds of weather, along with my um, uh, research teammates. We've got uh, Mark Weber and Izzy Shapaniak and Dr. Tim Markowitz from the Marine Mammal Center as part of our cetacean field research team. And we've published papers on this about the return of porpoises to San Francisco Bay. And we've really been able to use the Golden Gate Bridge as an amazing platform, a wonderful wildlife observatory um, that I think people just didn't really know about before uh, in terms of uh, being able to look at cetaceans. So uh, sometimes we also go out in boats and here's uh, two pictures that I took five years apart in a boat. So it's very hard to identify individual porpoises, but here we have an unusual one where we've got this scar that's a little bit fork shaped. The same scar five years later shows up and look, there is a calf, so now we know this is a female. She's accompanied by a dependent calf here. So that's pretty, pretty cool. You can find some of that stuff out. We also are looking for different uh, pigmentation differences in these porpoises so we can track some, and some are extreme. Here's a, a one we called Mini Moby, a white porpoise um, that was, we, you could see from a long ways away, uh, and it was around the um, bay for about uh, three years. Um, and we haven't seen it uh, recently, but anyway, that's quite an unusual one to be able to see and compared to this normal pigmented porpoise here on the right. And we've seen behavior that it is really hard to see anywhere else. Porpoises aren't as um, confident or as bold as bottlenose dolphins. They won't come to the bow of a boat to ride at the bow wave, but they will come sometimes behind a ship and ride a wake. And so here's a mother and calf that rode this wake right underneath the Golden Gate Bridge past me. And feeding, that's one of the things we really, uh, one of the first places in the world we can see naturally feeding harbor porpoises. It's really hard to see this otherwise because they're shy and they'll, uh, if you go out in a boat, they'll often change their behavior and they won't act like they would naturally. If you're on the bridge, they don't know you're there and they're just going about their business. So. Um, this is a fantastic picture of a porpoise with an American shad in its mouth um, that was taken. We actually wrote a paper about this kind of behavior too, catching these uh, fish that are a little larger than we would have expected them to be catching in San Francisco Bay. So here's something we often see is a seabird, like the, here, here a pelican, uh, mostly gulls, um, and the porpoise see this same fish and believe me, half the time, the seabird makes it to the fish before the porpoise can, it, unbelievable. And I'll try to show you a little bit of um, video of this, what this looks like from the bridge. Now we're gonna see a porpoise here and it'll turn on its side because it's just easier for it to maneuver near the surface that way. And uh, it can make really quick turns like that and go after a fish, but you'll see these gulls are absolutely keyed in on this and they'll land and hit and get a little small anchovy even before the porpoise can. But that's, that's their life out there under the, under the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. The other thing, of course, we're, we're very interested in is, are they having calves in the bay? Uh, what is their um, calving rate? Are they having calves every year, every other year on the East Coast? They do have calves uh, every year in, in places like the Gulf of Maine. But out here, we've got uh, along the California coast, we're not sure, it may be more like once every two years or a mix of, of things where some females uh, have the strength, the capacity to have uh, a baby every year and some do not. And uh, they're born in midsummer and they stay with the mother through the, to the next spring, separate, and then the mother might or might not have a calf again. The most surprising thing we found was this when we finally saw sexual behavior and, and we rarely see porpoises leaping. If you see a dolphin leaping, that is a sign of excitement or there's food in the area. And it's pretty frequent to see bottles dolphins leaping there just like you would when they train them at an oceanarium. But harbor porpoises rarely 
uh, leap free of the water. And we found that it's really only when they're mating or attempting to mate when this happens. So this is a picture I took several years ago now and I brought it back into my computer and we went, what is this? This is a penis and it's a very large one. It's, it's really literally larger, twice as large as the one that you see on a much larger bottomless dolphin. So we started wondering what they're using it for in terms of how they go about mating. What are their mating tactics and strategies? And no one had ever seen wild mating porpoises before, but we had again, this platform of the Golden Gate Bridge. So we started photographing them over years, and we've seen this over a hundred times now, where the male approaches the female only on her left side. And this it has to do with this evolution of how uh, these, this particular species is very unique, and the uh, reproductive trap, uh, tract of the female has adapted so that the male must approach her on the left side to mate. And it's a very, very fast uh, operation, and I'll show you some video here. That's the male rushing at the female at the surface. It's almost like a jousting, and here's it's slowed down. And I, I'm actually, I think what I'll do is I might go try to go back and play that again because I know it's hard, hard to see this and take it in. So here it is again, a mating. And, and that wasn't a successful copulation, but it was an attempt by the male to mate with the female. And she threw up her flukes to say, nope, uh, get out of here. And so that's what happened. She, as she threw, threw her flukes into the air, um, then the male cannot successfully um, copulate with her. So this is a whole uh, area that we never expected to get into. I never expected to be involved in uh, watching porpoise sex from the Golden Gate Bridge, but you have to, kind of follow the observations where they go and that's really where the science comes in. And one of the things we found out was that this uh, mating activity was really happening right around the Golden Gate Bridge. And we didn't see it as much when we were out on boats in the bay. We didn't see it at all when we were out in the ocean. And so we, we started realizing that this particular area, the narrowest spot one mile across from San Francisco to Marin is really a unique area socially for the porpoises. It's like they're spread out in the ocean, they're spread out in the bay, but when they come through this one mile wide uh, strait, that's when they concentrate. And it's like, um, if you can imagine living out in rural areas and on, on the weekend, on Saturday night, everybody comes to the barn dance. Well, the barn dance is happening and it's right under the Golden Gate Bridge. And, uh, that's why we're seeing this kind of um, sexual behavior here. Males come, they know females are gonna pass through. And so uh, we're seeing a lot of social activity there. And it's been pretty amazing uh, to witness. And if you wanna see uh, harbor porpoises, I recommend going out at high tide. Get a tide table because the tides change um, throughout the, uh, the weeks, the days, they shift a little bit. So you've got to get a tide table, go out at high tide on the Golden Gate Bridge. I like to go out in late morning so that the sun is uh, not, this, there's no shadow from the bridge right underneath me. And uh, you will pretty much be guaranteed to see harbor porpoises over the next so, hour or so. Uh, I usually stay out maybe two hours at, at most on the bridge when uh, we're doing our uh, research uh, photography work. Okay, bottlenose dolphins, a much bigger, uh, stronger um, uh, animal with a lot of different behaviors. In fact, one of the things we see when bottlenose dolphins come into the bay is that they can do all kinds of behaviors that we don't see from harbor porpoises, like playing more and um, just sort of being excited uh, around each other and they're, they're more social. Uh, often harbor porpoises you'll see in ones and twos and threes, uh, but bottlenose dolphins will come in in groups of 10, 12, 15 or more um, into the bay or along our coast. They also notice their lifespan 40 to 50 years compared to 10 or 11. And so because of that, we're able to do a lot uh, more science in terms of tracking them over time. And this is what they look like. And um, they have a taller dorsal fin. So I wanna compare that for a second. Oh, here's Ocean Beach. And my uh, research partner, uh, Izzy Shapania, took this uh, not that long ago um, when there was a 
a, a young one, a calf, between two adults right off uh, Ocean Beach. So Cliff House is up on the left here. And this is what it looks like if you're sort of looking out uh, from, from a beach. And here's the difference again, the short triangular fin of a harbor porpoise and the long curved swept back fin uh, of a bottlenose dolphin. And they're in different parts of our bay. This is the Bay uh, Richmond Center Fell Bridge and Red Rock Island um, in the uh, background. So they, they're there and Alam Alameda, they've been seen a number of times. And for a while off Alameda, we had this solitary dolphin, Kaimi was named by the local canoe club in Alameda. And um, this one stayed for three years, uh, mostly by itself until it joined some others and has now been seen out on the coast. So we don't know why it didn't really socialize uh, normally at first, but it's, it's doing pretty well now, uh, we think, and uh, it's gonna be growing up. It takes several years for these dolphins to really reach adulthood, like about 11 or 12 years. So it, it takes a while. What we do with the dolphins is use photo identification, meaning we wanna get a good picture of the dorsal fin, because here's a picture I took at Ro Rodeo Beach with a surfer looking at a dolphin going by, put that into your computer and you can see these nicks and uh, bigger notches. Um, and those are unique to each adult dolphin. So this one has been given a name, Gumpy, and uh, it was given actually its name in Monterey Bay because that animal's come up from Monterey Bay to live now um, off our coast. And we've got a, a catalog now with 113 adults in it. But what's amazing is that some of these animals like this one, Bliss, um, has been first seen in San Diego in, back in the 1980s. So there's a really uh, a lot of dolphins have moved way up the coast, um, leaving Southern California. And that's really the, the story. That's why they're so different than harbor porpoises. Harbor porpoises are native to our coast and have never not been on our coast. They left San Francisco Bay and they were driven out. That's the story I told you about World War II. And now they're back because of better environmental conditions in the bay. But bottlenose dolphins were not seen in historical times um, until 1983. So in 1983, there was a big El Nino year, warm water was along the coast. They moved up to Monterey Bay and they've been creeping up ever since. Uh, around 2007, eight, they really started uh, being seen more in San Francisco. 2010, we started seeing them regularly. Now they've been seen regularly up to Sea Ranch in Sonoma and uh, sometimes to Mendocino. We've even seen a couple move all the way past and have been seen in Puget Sound. So their population, we're not talking about a lot of animals. Harbor porpoises, we're talking seven, 8,000 just off our part of the coast of San Francisco from say Pigeon Point to the Russian River. Here, uh, along the entire California coast, there's maybe only 650 or 700 bottlenose dolphins that live in this sort of coastal zone only about a, within a mile from shore. And we know that um, they're having calves in our area because we see neonates. And you can tell a neonate very readily around here because it has vertical white lines, these stripes on it. And those stripes are from when the baby was uh, inside uh, the mother's womb, it's sort of crunched up, it's squished. And when it's born and it comes out, uh, it stretches out and these are stretch marks. And these stretch marks will fade after a couple of months. So you know this is really neonates that we're, we're seeing here uh, in the bay and uh, along our, our coast. So that's a pretty good sign that some of these dolphins that only existed in Southern California are now uh, finding food, they're navigating their way around here and they're having uh, calves right up here. One of the interesting and unexpected things that's happened is that as these bottlenose dolphins have moved north, they run into harbor porpoises. There's no harbor porpoises in Southern California. So they start meeting harbor porpoises and they start having these uh, interactions, which are, can be often very aggressive. The bigger, tougher bottlenose dolphins will beat up the um, sometimes the harbor porpoises and sometimes even leading to death, the fatal attacks. We've seen that off San Francisco and in the Bay a few times. The Marine Mammal Center certainly gets uh, every year 
harbor porpoises that are dead um, and stranded from uh, a lethal attack by a bottlenose dolphin. And here's, here's a picture of one. I know this can be disturbing, but I just wanted to show you what this looks like. Um, so these marks on the side of this uh, animal, this harbor porpoise, are rake, tooth rake marks from bottlenose dolphin. And if you were to measure these marks, they're about one centimeter uh, wide across. And that's exactly the intertooth distance of a bottlenose dolphin, an adult bottlenose dolphin. And um, it, it apparently, from what we've been able to do through photo identification and other researchers in Monterey Bay, this is happening and being done by young male bottlenose dolphins, not the females um, and not really even many of the adult males, but it's these young males that don't have, they seem to be frustrated and they've got a lot of maybe literally testosterone in them. And they're taking it out on the smaller, weaker um, cousins, uh, cetaceans uh, in their area. Uh, so it's pr pretty interesting. Now, there's thousands of bonglos, um, thousands of harbor porpoises along our coast and only a few uh, dolphins. So it's not uh, likely to affect the population of the harbor porpoise, but it is a really interesting thing that can happen. And it's an unexpected thing when two different species are meeting. Let's talk about whales. So gray whales um, have been all along our coast for thousands of years, migrating from their feeding grounds in Alaska to their breeding grounds in Baja in uh, Mexico. And in normally, in normal years, what we see, especially we've spent a lot of time at the Golden Gate Bridge, we'll see two or three gray whales come in under the Golden Gate Bridge, um, circle around the bay a little bit, and then leave after a, a day, and they'll go on their way on their migration. So we don't see a lot of them in San Francisco Bay, but that has certainly changed over the last few years. So in 2000, really 18, we saw a few extras, but by 2019, we were seeing this kind of behavior. So this is a gray whale in very shallow water at Kirby Cove, which is right outside the Golden Gate. So that's San Francisco here, this is on the Marin side. And this is a gray whale that is rolling on its side in the surf to feed. It's trying to get down to the mud they don't feed on in mid-level uh, water, like they don't feed necessarily on krill or fish, um, but they're down in the muck and they're getting protein like crabs and shrimp and uh, <clears throat> little uh, worms and things that they can get protein from the um, shallow muds. And that's what this one's doing. And so that's something we really hadn't seen before. But and then we started seeing them come in the bay a lot. And we thought, well, they must be stopping over on their migration to uh, use San Francisco, it's very calm water. Uh, and, uh, and they're looking sometimes for a little bit of food. There's not a lot of food in San Francisco Bay compared to Alaska, but there's a little and they seem to be um, trying to get at it. And so this is the kind of scene we've been able to see over the last um, few years in San Francisco each uh, winter and into spring. And we try to photo identify them. It's not as easy as a dolphin. They don't have a dorsal fin, but they do have unique uh, splotching, these splotchy uh, pigmentation uh, modeled. And we can um, take pictures and identify individuals. And one individual we saw has was stayed in San Francisco Bay for a total of six weeks. So that's quite, quite a long time. But the other thing that's been happening, of course, is that many of these uh, whales we've been seeing these uh, gray whales are dying and dying in San Francisco Bay and um, we, we, this is a was a day in which there was two had died in very uh, close in time and they were dragged up um, towed up to Angel Island where the Marine Mammal Center uh, came out and did a necropsy um, along with the California Academy of Sciences team to find out what was the cause of death of these animals? And the main finding is that these animals were uh, suffering from malnutrition. They weren't getting enough food and they, they, they were starving. But in addition to that, there was also some of these animals were getting hit by ships while they were in San Francisco Bay. So it was sort of like a one-two punch for them. They were weakened and maybe a little slowed down from malnutrition uh, not having enough food, 
and then they were uh, also getting hit by ships. And so um, the federal government declared, that NOAA declared an unusual mortality event. And that's a, sort of their phrase for a wildlife emergency where you wanna go out and study what is going on with this, why is this happening? And it could well be that there are changes up in the Arctic, of course, that's affecting their feeding, so they're not getting enough food. But there's also um, this possibility that there's an awful lot of gray whales. Uh, before this unusual mortality event, their numbers had reached maybe 25,000, some, somewhere in that number, which is a pretty large number of gray whales. They think it was more or less their historical numbers. Um, but uh, they probably lost five or 6,000 just in the last uh, two or three years from this kind of event. So we'll have to see where this goes, but the Marine Mammal Center, uh, our team and, and the folks, the clinicians, the, the ones that do the uh, necropsy work and post-mortem work um, are really trying to keep a close eye on this and see what is happening. And so this is the kind of thing, there's a photo I took of high-speed um, passenger ferry in the bay and notice that these gray whales don't have a big high profile, not even as much as a humpback whale. They're, they sit real low on the water. They're hard to see. So that's one of the things we want to try to figure out is ways for vessels to be aware of whale presence in the bay. So let's talk about the, the, the other species of whale, the humpback whale, which is even larger than the gray whale. And uh, interestingly, and what's important is that their diet is either fish or krill. So krill is not in the bay, it's offshore, um, but fish are in the bay and that's what's attracting them uh, into San Francisco Bay. But the real truth of the matter is that uh, humpback whales have been around our, off our coast for a long time and they were hunted. And in fact, what you should know is that the last whaling station in the United States was in San Francisco Bay. It was in Richmond and it operated until 1971 and they were uh, taking humpback whales right off our shore. They go out in boats under the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, harpoon humpback whales and bring them back um, into Richmond and uh, process them into pet food. So that's the, the sad story of hunting whales uh, in our area. But that changed, the, the hunting of course stopped years ago um, and the really it was about 2016 that we first started seeing whales come in San Francisco Bay to feed. And they called it in the, in the San Francisco Chronicle, a whale of Palooza. And I don't really, there's no definition of that, but there was a lot of them. Sometimes up to 20 whales could be seen in San Francisco Bay on one day. And um, this is really different than say Humphrey the humpback. That was the sort of the more famous story. And we had Delta and Dawn. We've had some whales come and get lost in San Francisco Bay and then go all the way up towards Sacramento before they turned around and made it back out the Golden Gate into the ocean. These guys are coming in and absolutely focused on feeding. They're coming in for fish and they're finding them. And so this is the kind of things you can see, these kinds of pictures we're able to take from our boats. We have a permit, a federal permit to go out and be able to get close to be able to, to photograph uh, these animals so we can uh, figure out what their behavior, what they're doing, and as try to photo identify each individual. And so this is what you can see from the Golden Gate Bridge. And I was astounded being up there and watching this happen when I'm out there really looking for porpoises and seeing these huge um, you know, 50 foot animals um, coming up underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. And there's another one that we went out and we're, we're doing some uh, photo ID work on under the bridge. And this is what it looks like from the bridge. A uh, little video clip here. Not one, not two, but uh, it's actually gonna be three humpback whales right under the bridge. And they were going up and down feeding And it's just dragging his tail down. Really beautiful to see this. And we put together a catalog of each individual whale. And instead of a dorsal fin, we're looking at the underside of the flukes. And they're all unique, as you can see right here. There's different black and white patterns um, that you can see for uh, each uh, animal. And that's how we can tell that there's been at least 77 different whales using San Francisco Bay since 2016. 
And we're still seeing new ones this year. We got a couple of new ones um, this year as well. The other thing you can do that's pretty amazing is that you can track these animals using that uh, photograph of their underside of their flukes all the way across the, their, to their breeding grounds. So here's a mother and her calf. This is right near Kirby Coat. So the Golden Gate Bridge is to the right just a little bit. And um, we were able to compare those photos taken by researchers in Puerto Vallarta who saw the same mother and calf and then a couple of months later ends up in San Francisco. So we really just, well, a few months. So this is the end of February. So March, April, May, and into sort of half of June um, to get up to San Francisco. So a few months there. And um, they are also been seen in Monterey Bay. And we can do this with multiple animals. So we're able to um, really track these animals more than just being in San Francisco Bay. And this is the, another a view from the bridge. And really what we're looking for is what are they doing? And this is a picture of three humpback whales that are uh, simultaneously lunge feeding at the surface, trying to catch fish. And here you can actually see the fish. These are anchovy. And they're leaping out of the way of the jaws of death here, <laughs> trying to escape this whale. You can see that's the, the um, warming hut and Chrissy Field in the background right there. So the Golden Gate Bridge is just to the right. And why now, and, and, and one of the questions is why all of a sudden is this change? We've never seen this historically. We don't know if this has happened in the past. It certainly hadn't been reported. Um, but one of the reasons is um, there's a lot more humpback whales now than there used to be, uh, at least uh, in the last, say, couple of hundred years or hundred years. Um, when I started looking at humpback whales back in the 70s, there was probably around 2,000 in all of the North Pacific. And now there's over 20,000. So 10 times more humpback whales. And that's what you get when you stop hunting them. And it's a good thing. And they're finding food. If they don't find enough krill offshore, they'll come inshore. And, uh, and if they're finding lots of krill offshore, they'll go off. Now, interestingly enough, a lot of you may know about the humpbacks in Hawaii that come in the winters. You can see them off Maui in particular. Um, and those uh, often feed in Alaska, whereas the whales that um, are in our area are breeding in Mexico, mainly, uh, a few in Central America, and they come up to California and Oregon to feed. So these animals aren't really much mixing between the Hawaii and the Mexican animals, and ours are still on the endangered or a threatened uh, for the Endangered Species Act list. And that's because instead of crossing an empty ocean, basically empty ocean, to go to your sort of more or less pristine feeding grounds in Alaska, these guys have to run a gauntlet all the way along the coast through uh, areas where there's a lot of shipping and fishing gear, and they can get entangled and hit by uh, ships. So their population is still considered threatened um, along our coast. One of the other things we're doing is that we're uh, working with an outfit called Cascadia Research Collective to uh, start a tagging program to understand a little bit more about what whales are doing in the bay. So this is the, I'm going to show you the very first and only so far tagging uh, uh, event of these whales in the bay. And so here's a video of how it's done. This is in San Francisco, it's a little foggy. And so he's taking a carbon fiber pole and just popping a little sensor package on that whale. And I, here's a picture of a whale that I took that same day. And this is uh, uh, the whale underneath the Golden Gate Bridge and it's got suction cups. So it's not permanent. It's just gonna last for a couple of hours. The suction cups will give way after a couple hours and you uh, retrieve the device and it'll tell you all kinds of things about how far down this animal went and what, it's, what it was doing underwater. And I'm going to explain that. Um, this is some of the pretty interesting research, new research that we're just about to publish on. So there were three whales tagged that day, blue, orange, and green. This one didn't stay on very long, but these sp spent a couple of hours on the whales. So we got an idea of what they were doing. So the one that was tagged inside the bay, this is the Golden Gate Bridge here, San Francisco and Marin. And it came under the bridge. I took that photo and it mixed with this other whale, the one that's labeled in orange and then it left. So what we can do is 
do what's called a dive profile. So this, the animal in orange, where it's doing all these breaths up to the surface, this is the surface where it's coming up and breathing, going down and feeding. So this is 30 meters down, about 100 feet. And that's where the fish sonar that day showed the, the anchovy shoals were. And it, you can even tell when exactly it was feeding because the sensors actually can feel when that animal opens its mouth and suddenly slows in the water and because it's, it's taking track of its kinematics, the motion. And so you can tell when each whale is opening its mouth underwater to feed. So you get a huge amount of data for this. And the, the, the last thing I really wanna talk about is the danger of uh, ships in the bay for these whales. Because this is something the Marine Mammal Center is very much uh, trying to work on with the various agencies um, that are dealing with shipping in the bay. Um, and you can see how this is uh, in uh, Treasure Island in the background, how big these ships are. And here's a picture I took of uh, uh, in the Golden Gate Straits, the Golden Gate Bridge is just the left. And you can see this is a little small puff of uh, steam, which is really just the whale spout there and how big these are. And you think the biggest thing in San Francisco is the Salesforce Tower? Well, it's not. It's the ships that actually come in under the Golden Gate Bridge. Like I've seen this one that the Benjamin Franklin, and look at this. This is how big a humpback whale is next to it. And so, and it's not just the ships we see when things get crazy on the bay and there's a regatta or something and, and there's dense sailboat traffic, they can be pretty close to these whales sometimes too. And this map, I just wanna show you because this really is the culmination of five years of work where we've been looking at uh, gray whales in the orange and humpback whales in blue and where they show up. And notice they uh, take up different areas in the bay. The Golden Gate Bridge is sort of hidden under here, but these uh, whales, the humpbacks that come in to feed on anchovy are here uh, out in the gate area. Whereas the gray whales that may be feeding tend to go in these shallower areas much further into the bay, Treasure Island and Angel Island in there. And that's where the high speed ferry routes are. Whereas here where the humpbacks are is the big ships, container ships and the tankers that are coming through um, to the ports. And the last thing I just wanna leave you with is one of the things we're uh, really trying to recommend and push is an expansion of the National Marine Sanctuary because the National Marine Sanctuary has a program to have ships slow down to 10 knots. And instead of from 15 to 20, they're going, should go 10 knots. That gives the whale more time to get out of the way of the ship. And it gives the skippers and the bar pilots more time to see a whale and be able to perhaps maneuver the ship out of the way to avoid striking a whale. And one of the things happening is that that's great in the sanctuary, but San Francisco and the uh, Daly City, Pacifica, that coast, Ocean Beach, all the way to the gate, that is not in the National Marine Sanctuary. It was actually excluded from the sanctuary back in the 1980s when the sanctuary was established. And uh, one of the things they're now talking about is expanding the sanctuary boundary to take up this formally or ex currently excluded zone and make it part of the sanctuary. And then those speed reductions could take effect uh, throughout this area, including all the way up to the, to the Golden Gate. And in the Bay, we're also talking to the Harbor Safety Committee, which includes uh, folks from the Coast Guard and the shipping industry to talk about uh, these issues. And uh, we're making some progress there. And um, you know, our attitude is that we wanna see zero whales harmed or, or harassed and so that's, that's hopefully um, where we're headed. And so we can have some time for questions. And uh, I wanna thank a lot of the, the folks that have been supporting our work from the California Academy of Sciences um, to the uh, San Francisco State Estuary and Ocean Science Center, the whale tours folks, Cascadia and, and others. Um, and I wanna, do wanna leave you with my uh, email address because if you can't get your uh, uh, questions answered during this uh, program, then uh, you can absolutely write me later and I'll try to handle anything. And lastly, if you see um, a bottlenose dolphin anywhere on our coast, if you see any whale in San Francisco, please go 
to the Marine Mammal Center website, which is right there at the bottom of the page. And there's a little link at the top that says report an animal and there's one for um, whales and dolphins. And that would be greatly appreciated. It would, it would help our research. And um, you can, we'd love to have citizen scientists helping us. So um, thank you. Um, Eric, back to yeah. you. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, I think, you know, I can, I can speak for everyone there. Just an incredible set of pictures. And, and thank you so much for, you know, for sharing this and your expertise with us. Um, we do have a couple of great questions, um, which I'll, I'll try and get to as many as I can here. And I do just want to remind everybody again, um, you know, if we can't get to your question tonight, um, you know, Bill has shared that email. We will send out uh, as well an email link um, to this presentation to everybody who's attended afterwards. We will include in there some links, um, you know, both to contact and, and for further information. So uh, thank you very much. Um, Bill, one of the just, you know, sort of questions people ask, you talked about going out to see the porpoises at high tide. Um, are there any other similar tips for seeing, uh, you know, humpbacks, especially the whales or the dolphins in times of day or conditions? Yeah, so um, the dolphins, uh, the best spot to go for bottlenose dolphins is um, Ocean Beach or the Cliff House uh, Land's End area. Um, and today uh, they were seen in Rodale Beach in Marin County. And in fact, one of our citizen scientists, uh, Darren Allen, who's been out there uh, quite a bit helping us, um, was able to get some photos. So we were able to identify a few of the uh, dolphins that were this morning out at Rodeo Beach. So uh, Rodeo Beach is a little bit harder. Um, they don't, they're not there every single day, but the best spots traditionally have been Ocean Beach to the Cliff House Land's End uh, area to, to try to see them. And then uh, in terms of whales, it's a little tougher. Um, in the winter, um, you can often see them from some of the, the points of land um, like uh, Cavallo Point where they're coming through or Fort Point underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. So you can see spouts and stuff when they're coming in. And the same is true humpback whales when they're in there. But it, it's, it's just much more hit and miss with the, um, with the whales. So you've got to sort of um, go out a lot. <laughs> we spend a lot of time in the field <laughs> and that's really the, the secret for, for the whales. Um, but one of the things we can do too is um, at the Marine Mammal Center Center is we can, you know, you can also write me and just say, you know, what's happening lately. And I can, uh, I'm happy to tell people what the latest uh, sightings have been. Great, thanks. Um... We had a couple of different versions of sort of a similar question, which is, you know, there's a number of other cetacean species off the coast. Um, if you had to pick any that might come into the bay or any that you're keeping out, one person asked specifically about rissos, dolphins, uh, any other sort of things you're looking for that, you know, especially as conditions change, might, might come into the bay sometime? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we're always thinking about that. And um, there, there was a Rissos uh, dolphin that had come into San Francisco Bay, um, but it was sick and quickly died. Um, it was uh, necropsied at the Marine Mammal Center. But um, so we don't really expect to see um, Rissos dolphins because they're squid eaters and there's not tons of squid in the bay. Uh, we would look for fish eaters or here's the species I'm always thinking about, orca. We know that killer whales are going up and down our coast. They'll be several miles out. Why haven't they figured out, wait a second, there's all kinds of uh, marine mammals to eat because there's marine mammal eating ones uh, off, off uh, our shore. So, but we've not seen them all the years I've been looking, I've never seen orcas, but that's one that could possibly learn how to navigate and, and, and come into San Francisco Bay sometime. Uh, keep an eye out for that for sure. <laughs> um, a number of people have asked about uh, humpbacks, particularly and sound, and and maybe expanding this to the other cetaceans. Are they sing? Are the humpbacks singing under the bay? And is there an issue for for any of these species with uh, the noise in the bay? Uh, so that's a great question, and I didn't have time to get into the acoustic pollution of San Francisco Bay. So we've got this environmental success story where. The bay is a lot cleaner than it used to be, thanks to the, like the Clean Water Act and, and other uh, laws that are preventing uh, sewage from flowing. Uh, you know, when I was when I was growing up in San Francisco Bay in the 50s, I remember coming across the bay would stink like a cesspool. 
because there was sewage going into the bay, there was industrial discharges, that's all changed. So we've got fish in the bay and that's attracted them, but we certainly have a lot of pollution in the form of underwater sound waves. And that's called acoustic pollution. It absolutely stresses cetaceans, uh, makes a big difference. Then there's two kinds, there's chronic, uh, the kind that there's just lots of noise always around the bay because there's lots of boats and, and, and shipping traffic. And then there's um, sort of acute uh, concussive noises when you're building a pier and you've got a blast and stuff, which really drives them away. So um, going back to the beginning of the question, are they singing in the bay? The answer is really no, because the singing is done by males on their breeding grounds. And we're not the breeding ground for the humpback whale. We are the feeding ground. And lots of both sexes use the bay and males and females. And um, they, we don't think uh, they're doing a lot of singing. Now, one of the things we haven't done yet is put down uh, hydrophones to listen. We plan to, but by look, we, we've already talked to researchers along the coast and we don't expect to really hear any singing in the bay. However, um, they are acoustic animals. They, they pay attention to acoustics. They com can communicate uh, with sound. And um, they're not like dolphins where they use um, echolocation. Uh, the, the baleen whales are a little different in that sense. But certainly, um, the acoustic pollution of San Francisco Bay is probably a serious problem for them. And, and it's one of the things that has made us wonder why these animals came in, they're coming from an ocean that's not probably as noisy out there into a very narrow area in the gate. And that sound is probably just bouncing all around in there. And then they put up with it because there's food and food will always attract these guys. Let's continue on that bill because that is, that is quite an interesting an area of ongoing research. I think, you know, the, the food has changed. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about uh, you know, the shift in humpback whales, particularly from krill to anchovies, uh, you know, and then the question in a year like this, where there's a big krill year, are they going to switch back? Yeah, so uh, humpback whales can switch uh, even within a day. So they can go immediately from fish to krill. So it, wherever it's better and more efficient for them, remember, the, these guys are really grazers. I mean, they, they're predatory in the sense that they're grabbing live food, but they're really like grazers, like um, big cattle, and they just need to get as fat as they can so they can go on their migration to their breeding ground where they don't eat at all for months at a time. They're living off their fat, particularly mothers that have got to convert their fat to milk to raise their uh, calf. So um, they want to go where uh, feeding is efficient. And if it's uh, cold, upwelling water offshore like there is this summer, it's very thick krill uh, offshore, they're gonna be out there. If that krill uh, in a, uh, different conditions, maybe a, a little bit warmer and El Nino comes along, the anchovy might bunch up near shore, then it gets very efficient to feed on anchovy. And that's what's been happening the last uh, say four out of five years. This summer, the krill is uh, getting to be uh, more dense offshore. And so that's where we've been seeing them. And the whale watching boats have been leaving San Francisco Bay and they just go a few miles offshore and there's humpbacks right there. So they're not gone from the entire area, but they just shift a little bit. And Bill, we have uh, maybe time for two more questions. So uh, I'll try and compress some here. Um, we have a couple of people who've asked about contaminants in the bay, um, you know, particularly the bay is sort of legacy of contamination. If there's any studies, um, you know, on the effect on any of these species? So that's a really good question. And we think about that a lot with the return of uh, harbor porpoises because they're the ones that spend the most time in the bay um, and would probably be the ones being most affected. And so uh, along with possibly gray whales because what do they do? They like to feed in the muck in the bottom. And if there's a legacy contamination say from the 1840s and 50s and 60s mining days when there was mercury coming into San Francisco Bay, settling into the mud, they could be disturbing that layer. And then uh, one of the things we already know from harbor porpoise studies is that if you take a blubber sample and look for pollutants in that blubber, uh, you can tell which populations are which because their pollutants are different. In Monterey Bay, the harbor porpoises tend to have more agricultural pesticides 
whereas up here, there's more industrial uh, types of pollutants in the blubber. So absolutely, um, residual pollution, historical pollution can affect these guys. And we'll just have to see, we'll have to do those studies um, to, to find out over time whether it's having an effect. But certainly the, the seeing gray whales come in and feed on the bottom and stir up the bottom of San Francisco Bay has caused us uh, some, some thinking about that and what, what kind of consequences could result. Thanks. And uh, maybe a last question for tonight. Uh, several people have asked uh, what they can do to sort of support the effort to expand the sanctuary. Um, and maybe similarly, is there anything um, that ships can do to uh, better avoid the whales? So the, uh, for the sanctuary, yeah, the, that'll be coming up. They're, they're going to be looking at their uh, management plan over the next couple of years. So there'll be public comment on that. So you'll be able to, uh, everybody will have a chance to comment on that in a, or probably in the next couple of years. Um, you'll see that out. Um, the ship, uh, you know, story is really, it's complicated because uh, there's no perfect way uh, that we found to keep all the whales perfectly safe because there's a lot of stuff going on at night that we can't see. We, we don't have whales individually tracked, like they don't have satellite tags on, so we don't know exactly where they're, and they can change in any minute. And what's worse is that particularly the humpback whales uh, absolutely ignore ships a lot of the time. I mean, they'll, they may get out of the way if they're right in front of them, but when they're feeding, they're kind of oblivious to what's going on. And so really the idea is to get the ships to be in narrow uh, channels so that they're not scattered all over the, um, uh, the entrance to San Francisco Bay. That's why the Coast Guard has set up a specific narrow lanes they have to stay in and so to try to avoid the most whale rich areas. And then um, the slowing down is the other thing. But a third thing is we need a lot of eyes on the water. So one of the things we can do is have people report in, there's even a, an app called Whale Alert that they can get for their phone. And when they put in, oh, I see a whale, I'm in a boat or I'm on shore and I see a whale that goes in and that uh, information gets to NOAA. And now it's, it goes uh, point blue, um, uh, conservation is hosting that, but it goes to the uh, federal government and uh, information can go to ships. When we see uh, whales in the bay, we uh, also can alert the Coast Guard. We're on a boat and we can call vessel traffic service. They put out a notice to mariners immediately saying, look, there's a whale been seen in this area. So that's the kind of thing we need to do. Okay, so uh, I just want to say thank you again, Bill. Um, and remind everybody, we will send out um, uh, uh, an email with a recording of this presentation, as well as a couple of links. I've talked to a couple of people in the chat actually who've suggested follow-up links as well. So uh, a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, check that out in your email inbox, uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, and then, you know, once more, thank you, Bill, so much for uh, sharing your expertise, sharing your photos, uh, sharing the videos with us. Um, it's just been a uh, you know, fantastic, fascinating presentation. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us um, here. Uh, thank you for supporting Bay Nature. And uh, we wish you all the best and good night.